Hello and welcome to the Writer's Mindset Podcast with me, Ellie Betts. Christina is still hiding away, hard at work on our new patron exclusive series, Healthy Habits. We're here to create a community of authors who persevere, are their most productive selves, and publish at a speed that they are comfortable with. This week, Christina had a chat with Tammy Lebrecht to discuss reader magnets and newsletters. Tammy Lebrecht lives in central Maine with three spoiled cats, two naughty dogs, and dozens of fictional characters that keep her awake at night. She writes under a few pen names across several genres, including urban fantasy, thriller, and lit RPG. Under her own name, you can find her writing romance novels that apparently nobody reads, or teaching at newsletterninja.net. I do want to say a big thank you to all of our patrons for your support. We couldn't do this without you. As a patron, you get early access to episodes, bonus content, and our undying gratitude for supporting all of the hard work that goes into creating these episodes to inspire and motivate you. And as I mentioned, Christina has been working on a patron exclusive series called Healthy Habits. We've had a lot of great feedback so far. It is definitely worth checking out. Healthy Habits is available on our Patreon. To find out more, visit patreon.com forward slash writers mindset. With me today on the Writer's Mindset is email marketing legend Tammy Lebrecht. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. So for those of I can speak, I swear. For our listeners, you have <laughs> Tammy just like shaking her head at me. <laughs> For our listeners who haven't heard of you or Newsletter Ninja, can you just share a little bit about yourself, please? Oh, a little bit about myself. Okay, so I am um, a... um, No, I can't, apparently. That was a real stumper of a question. So I am an author. I write in a bunch of different genres, not terribly successfully in any of them. And then as it happens, I also just kind of turned out to be kind of good at this newsletter thing. I have a real affinity for it. Um, it, It's a thing that just made a lot of sense to me when I first started hearing authors talk about your author newsletter and how it's a good way to relate to your fans and, you know, build a fan base and all of that. Um, early on when I was first exploring indie publishing, um, I heard interviews with Mark Dawson, who referred to it as building your own book bub, which sounded good to me. Um, I heard interviews with Nick Stevenson. I think that was the first time I actually ever paused a podcast and went to get like a pen and paper so I could take some notes. Those things made a ton of sense to me. And over time, I found myself in a position where, you know, fellow indie authors would, you know, have a question or have an idea about a newsletter thing. And they'd say, oh, what about this, this? And I would say, have you tried X? Have you thought about Y? Maybe if you did Z. And people would look at me and say, where did you learn that? And I would go, I made it up in my head. So I just sort of by default became like good at newsletters, which is great. That's a good place to be. Um, and eventually I decided to write a book about it. The, the, the very long, short version of a very long story is I wrote a book, came out in 2018. I had the good fortune to have David Gogren, who had taken a course with me, um, write the foreword for that, which gave it a lot of momentum for sure. Um, and I had worked with authors like Chris Fox, you know, people who gave me a lot of a lot of push in the indie community. People read the book. They really liked the book. It's a very um, kind of top level philosophical kind of, not philosophical in the sense of philosophy, but the philosophy of newsletters sort of look at the idea of author newsletters. There's not much in the way of like, push this button, pull this lever, set it up exactly this way, which garnered a few complaints at the time, but has made it, I think, more evergreen. It's still a book that people read. So I'm excited about that. So that's me. I I talk about author newsletters. That's my niche. It's pretty niche um, not to be confused with Nietzsche. And so that's just where that's my comfort zone. I tell people how to make their newsletters better. And as best I can, I try to translate broader internet marketer principles down to something that works for us, because of course we're selling $3 eBooks, not $10,000 coaching packages. So the things that work for them have to be transmuted before they apply to our situation. I'm kind of a translator. Yeah. I like that way of putting it. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, 
but I work in marketing as well and have done for about a decade. And a lot of the principles I see authors use are about 10 years old. They're not the latest marketing principles. And when you say stop doing that, it's not like going to help or be as beneficial as you think anymore. They get kind of defensive, like you're not being helpful. You're being a dickhead. (laughs) Well, um, I've, I've, I can't say I've never been accused of being a dickhead, but I do try to make it as helpful as I can. Um, And one of the one of the good things, a a piece of good fortune for me is that I do have that kind of like excuse to fall back on where I don't have to tell them like, yeah, don't do that. That's stupid. Instead, I say, oh, I see how that would work for such and such a situation. But here's how we're a little different. And then you can kind of pull them along and and explain to them how really our thing is different. Selling a $3 ebook is at once much easier and also much harder than whatever it is they're selling out there in the 10 year old, you know, black hat marketer forums. <laughs> yeah. I remember reading once someone said that the less people pay, the more they expect. <laughs> like you'll often see the reviews on perma free books and people are cruel. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say the less I say about that, the better, (laughs) because I try not to complain about reviews in public, but um, I have never gotten the kind of furious, angry, mean, bone deep, mean uh, reviews, if you will, on my expensive course. Well, it's not expensive. It's a few hundred bucks, but my more expensive course than I got on a $5 ebook, like not even close. People pay me a ton of money for, you know, four weeks of a course and go away enormously grateful. People pay five bucks for a book and are like, this was total garbage. Okay. All yeah. right. <laughs> sure. So today we are talking about reader magnets. So let's just go right back to basics for a minute. What is a reader magnet and why are they important to us indies? So a reader magnet is something that you offer to a reader to get them to join your mailing list. Uh, The corollary, of course, is the lead magnet. It's a type of lead magnet that you would see if you, you know, somebody wanted you to sign up for their their mailing list and then they're going to try to, for example, sell you one of those big coaching packages or whatnot. Um, Internet marketers sell a whole bunch of different things. We sell, by and large, books. That's pretty much exclusively it. So our reader magnets kind of by default tend to fall into some type of story or sometimes something that's story adjacent. I have a whole long list in my most recent book, which is all about reader magnets. Um, it's called, If You Give a Reader a Cookie, which is hilarious to me. me too. And so that can be, I know it made me laugh and laugh, but yeah. so that can be, you know, reader, uh, that can be book adjacent stuff like maps or, you know, just things that the readers of your specific genre or book would enjoy having. But a lot of the times it does just wind up being something that's story-based or either it's, you know, a, a prequel story or a side story or, Romance is huge on epilogues. People love to have an epilogue in romance and some other genres, but it's nowhere is it as big as romance. And they're important because like everything else, it is incredibly hard to keep people's attention. Even if you manage to actually get some visibility on a book of yours and people buy it and they liked it, how are they going to know when the next one shows up? Amazon is not as reliable about making sure they get an email about it down the road. They're certainly not hurting for books because I don't know if you've talked to any readers lately, but they're like to be red piles are always, you know, mountainous and skyscraper high. So for me, once you've had somebody read the book, if there's a call in the back of that book, a call to action that says, come pick up this reader magnet that's related to the book you just read, and you can capture that email address, you have the opportunity to let them know when the next thing is out or to introduce them to the stuff you already wrote that they might not have seen yet. So to me, it's the easiest way to market to people. And frankly, it's one of the most cost-effective ways to market to people. And it's very personal. Newsletters are, you know, you land in someone's inbox, they read it on their phone, you know, in bed, in the bathroom, like you're, you're right there with them all the time. If you've captured their name for, or their email address would be a better way to put it for your um, newsletter. So that's why they're important. Just being able to get people onto the list with some kind of incentive. And it just always is easier to get people to sign up if there's an incentive, plain and simple. Yeah, I've I've only come across one author who managed to grow their email list without a reader magnet. And I can't for the life of me remember her name. There was somebody um recently on 
a different podcast. Was it Lindsay Broker's podcast? I think it might have been. Um, and I know that she mentioned that she does not require an opt in. I am currently trying that out with my nonfiction. I feel like nonfiction is a very different beast than fiction, and it will take me a while to figure out how well that translates. Um, but it's actually been pretty successful with my nonfiction. So if somebody is interested enough to show up at your website and you say, oh, do you want this free thing? And you can sign up for my list if you want to. Mostly they do. I'm not, the only place where I'm really hesitating is I'm not sure how well that would work if you're doing like targeted promotions with it, like say um, a book funnel group promo or something over at Story Origins, um, where you'd be talking about, you know, people downloading 12 books. And so perhaps I would rather grab the sign up and then hopefully win them over during my welcome sequence or whatever, so that they end up liking me as opposed to just handing them a book and letting them go. But the thing is, I always teach that your welcome sequence should sort of repel people who aren't going to turn out to be your kind of subscriber anyway. So maybe just not collecting the ones who aren't keen on it in the first place is the right choice. I just don't, I don't know. I'm experimenting with it and I will definitely report back because I think it's very intriguing. Oh, definitely. You want to be experimenting all the time with different things. And I think that's one of the fun things I find about being indie is that there's always something new to try because it stops yes. you from getting bored, being completely honest. <laughs> yes, 100%. I really like it. And I just like not having to ask permission. You know, I'm going to try this thing. I'm going to try that thing. And if it doesn't work, then I can pivot very quickly and stop doing that thing. Some experiments bear out pretty quickly and some don't. And I just, I really, I like not being beholden to anybody else, honestly. Same. When is the best time for an author to actually create and launch their reader magnet? Is there a right time or a better time? The best time to write your reader magnet is yesterday. The second best day is today. That's, <laughs> that's a meme, right? Um, so what I tell people is if you can, the best choice is, to, I always say bake it in because I'm juvenile. Um, I call them cookies. It's a cookie, the reader magnet. So bake it in. Ha, ha. I'm here for if it. You're... My blog's called the writer's <laughs> cookbook. I'm here for food analogies. There you go. See, bring on the food analogies. So if you're currently about to start writing a series or a trilogy, whatever, and as you're writing, you just think, hey, what, what would be the good cookie for this trilogy? Just whip it off as you're writing the trilogy. And then it's probably going to be finished first. You're not going to have like a four. $400 cover. It's not going to go off to the editor for three weeks. It'll be ready before the books are, in which case you can join a promotion on book funnel or story origins, or even just put it up on your website. You can run ads to a cookie, you know, all kinds of things and start building a list of people who are interested in that specific story before the launch and then launch to, you know, I don't know, a few hundred people instead of crickets, which is always nice. I'm having new authors who come to me before they've published. I'm telling them, stop, park. We're going to, we're going to stop the car right here and take a break. And you're going to just do 12,000 words. We're going to get that out while you finish the production of the books. You're going to be building a list. And my most recent author to do it launched their first cozy. It's a ghost cozy. So not like a witch cozy, but paranormal. Nice. Um, to like, I don't know, it was like 400, 500 people. I don't remember exactly how many, but they had collected some people in a book funnel um, group uh, promotion. And I would rather launch a book to 300 people who at least I know like the books I write than nothing, you know? And um, that did fine. They're not setting Amazon on fire. Their book two isn't out yet. They didn't make a million dollars, but they also sold books, which I'm here to tell you, most people who show up at this point, this late in the indie publishing game and just drop a new book from a new author or a new pen name on Amazon, nothing happens. And how would it, why would it? But if you've got this little bit of people that you've prepped ahead of time, that's fantastic. Um, but that said, if you, if you already have a bunch of books out, you know, you're not at the beginning of your journey. So you've got, you know, I don't know, four trilogies say, and you're looking at that and you're like, I can't write for reader magnet. I don't have time. Like this is too much. It's too overwhelming, but you don't have to do it right now. You don't have to do everything today. Right. I always want to give people permission to do whatever is the easiest thing for them. So if I say, no, go write a cookie for every single series right now, that's, that's awful. That's intimidating. Um, just take a look. What have you got? And what do you think would be the most effective thing to write something for or the easiest thing or which series do you have that sells the best so that a cookie for that series is probably going to get you the most sign up because it's the book that ends up in most people's hands or what series do you have that sells the worst and you want to give it a little bit of a boost. So maybe if you had 
this, you know, free thing that you could put out there for people. And then it naturally pushed sell through to the series itself. You'd get some more people looking at that series. There's all different ways that you can do it. Um, Some people just write for whatever they're going to write next. Some people write for the thing that's most recent. Like you just, you do you, whatever you think will work best, but you only have to do them one at a time, you know? And if you only have time to write one, maybe you write something that's not specifically related to any of your series, but it's just in your world, you know, so that people can at least kind of enter that way. And then down the road, as you have some time, you could write some things that are more specific. The, um, the best reader magnets that I see, the most effective ones are the ones that are very, very tightly aligned with either a book or a series that, that readers really liked. So that's kind of the ideal there. But you can also pull out and just write, you know, this is my world or this is the genre I write in, or even just if you have something that's a little off genre, it's a slightly different subgenre or whatever, you can, t- you can give that to people and say, this is a little different than what I write, but it has X, Y, and Z qualities that you've come to expect from my books. Something is always better than nothing. And Perfect, as we've heard, is the enemy of done. So just, you just do your best. Yeah, I love that. Um, I remember ages ago now, when I first started out, I was binge reading a particular author and her reader magnet was completely unrelated to the other books that she'd published. And I was disappointed because it was such a good book. (laughs) It was a standalone romance um, between a werewolf and a mermaid. But the problem, well, exactly. (laughs) But the problem was, it was such a good book because it was tight. There just wasn't enough conflict for it to carry a full length book. But as a reader magnet, it was a perfect introduction to the genre and the types of characters that she wrote. So in that way, it was kind of brilliant. That's one of the things that I recommend for people when they're looking at their catalog and saying, I don't, what am I even going to write a reader magnet about is that I very frequently tell people reader magnets are smaller stories. That's the thing. You don't have to give away a whole book. And in fact, I don't really recommend it just time-wise. And I'm really precious about books because they take me a bazillion years to write. So I I can't give away 70,000 words for free. Sorry. So I'm always saying, look for where the small story is that takes place somewhere in your little universe. And there are rules, of course, for shorter stories there. You know, you can throw out, you know, certain things that you would expect in a longer story, but you still have to hit those tropes. You still have to hit the kind of themes that are usually in your books so that people know what to expect from you, all of that kind of thing. Um, But when it's, when it's something that the thing you said is like, it so resonates with me, like there just wasn't enough story there to carry 70,000 words, but that didn't mean it wasn't really, really good. So you just look for the little stories and those are the ones that you give away because you couldn't have made them into a book anyway. Maybe there's a side character in one of your, you know, epic fantasies who's never going to carry an epic fantasy length book, but you could write a really funny or a really poignant story about something that happened to him before the books or, you know, off to the side while the books were taking place, but it wasn't part of the main storyline or whatever. And readers really love that because they identify already with those characters that you've written. If you can identify a fan favorite character, um, or even it doesn't have to be character. Sometimes it's a place or it's, you know, if you're writing fantasy, it can be like a fantastical creature. Or if you're writing uh, science fiction, it can be like a a ship. Think of, um, I want to say Serenity. That's not what the series was called. Firefly. Think of Firefly, right? People can get really attached to people, places, and things. And so if you can identify the fan favorites and that's your reader magnet, hey, do you want to read more about fan favorite X? People are like, yeah, I do. And it's a total no brainer, which is an absolute win for everybody. Yeah, that's how I came up with my latest reader magnet. I was originally going to have it focused on the daughter in my ghost series. And I started writing it and I was like, not only does this not work, but I'm really confusing what happens between book one and book two and including characters in this um, story that's meant to be set between book one and two who aren't introduced until book two. So I was confusing myself and it would have confused the reader and completely shot me in the foot. So I kind of stopped working on it for a bit and then started to think about who the most popular characters were. And I realized that I kept referencing something that happened to the mum in the story. And that was how she was outed as a ghost hunter to her entire school when she was 15. And I thought, you know what? That's a story. (laughs) There you go. And and then you've got the romance of the fact that um, 
her with her future husband, you've still got the best friend who can't see ghosts, who is as clueless as ever, but also very supportive. And you've got a little bit more about her relationship with her own mother, because her mother's an absolute, not a very nice person, we'll say. So (laughs) there's a lot of things going on there in quite a short space. And it was really fun to kind of explore what this 40 year old woman was like at 15 and how she approached things very differently compared to her daughter when she's a teenager. See, that is, that's just so fun to me. That's exactly the sort of reader magnet that I love more than anything. The one that like illuminates in some way, something that happened, um, makes you learn more about a character and so on and so forth. And it's pretty safe to say that if in your series, the mom character is there a lot. And like you said, you reference her outing, eventually people start to go, I'd kind of like to hear about that. And then you get to the end of the book and it says, do you want to read the story about that happening? And they go, yeah, yeah, I do. And how, I mean, like, a total no-brainer, not to repeat myself, but it's a total no-brainer. And that to me is always the best formula for a reader magnet. If you in your head can say to yourself, when somebody gets to the end and then it says, hey, do you want to read blah, blah, blah? And they're go- there's no way they would ever say no. If they liked that book, why would they say no? That's your winning formula for the reader magnet. Yeah. And it's funny because I spent ages going, what can I do as this reader magnet? Why is this idea not working? And the idea was in front of me the entire time. I was overthinking. Go back through the old stuff and see what jumps out at you is always a good method. Definitely. What would you say the best ways to market that reader magnet are once it's actually out there? Um, well, obviously you can do, uh, all of the, all of the normal stuff. Um, you can, you put it in the back of your book, you put it on your website, you, uh, all that, just the normal things. But I think that by and large, if you're trying to get yourself in front of an audience of people who haven't seen you, which is going to be the fastest way to kind of really boost that, that, um, subscriber count, you're probably going to want to do one of the like story origins, book funnel, those, uh, there's another one. Is it prolific works? I can't remember. Uh, but there are, uh, you know, these services where you go and you join and you get together with a bunch of other authors and you all offer your reader magnets to your own newsletters. So I send a newsletter and it says, here's a link to a page where you can download six, one of six, however many of the six reader magnets you want to, you want to, you don't call them reader magnets, obviously you want to read and people head over and they pick the ones that they like and download them. And that then of course, gets their email onto the lists of whomever's books they chose. I think that that's honestly right now the most effective way to do it. And it's certainly the least expensive way to do it. I know there are free levels, free options over at Story Origins. Book Funnel's lowest um, tier is, I think, $20 for a year. So you can like, you can very inexpensively get in front of a ton of people, which is very exciting. I just always tell people to be really choosy. One thing that you'll definitely see around the indie community is people telling you straight up that those don't work. And I'm here to tell you they absolutely do. Um, and I don't run book funnel or story origins, so I have no dog in this fight, but they absolutely do work, but it depends on how you use them. So if somebody joins every single promotion that's even tangentially related to their book and they get, you know, 14,000 subscribers in the first three months or whatever, yeah, they're mostly going to be garbage. We cannot build that way. You need to be choosy. You need to remember that the best subscriber to your mailing list is a person who just finished one of your books. And absent that, it's somebody who just finished a book that's just like like yours. So if I'm author A who writes werewolf cozies and are werewolf cozies a thing because I just totally kind of make it need to be if they're not. I would read they that. Just, I think okay. I was going to say like werewolf romance and then I don't know cozies happen. So you write werewolf cozies and you go out there and you see there aren't a lot of werewolf cozies. That's a problem. But you're not going to want to cross promote with say werewolf horror because those people won't like your werewolf cozy. You're going to want to look for like witch cozies, ghost cozies. Those are people who kind of abut your genre, right? Even though they're not exactly the same as you, they're probably going to be able to make the leap. Oh, I like these ones with ghosts in them. I might like one with a werewolf in it and off they go. So you just kind of want to make sure that you're sticking as close as possible to people that are already kind of predetermined that they would like your book. You just have to vet those those, um, promotions really carefully. But I find them currently at least to be the most effective way to really build a pretty decent list of subscribers 
subscribers pretty quickly. And I recommend them for everyone. Yeah, I actually have some of my most engaged readers from um, BookFunnel. And I didn't realize that until I opened my readers group on Facebook. And one of the joining questions is, how did you discover my books? Because obviously it's useful to know. And I was really surprised at the number of people who said BookFunnel. Most of them said either BookFunnel or searching for free reads on Amazon. And that really, really surprised me. I think there is a real prejudice against what we call freebie seekers, right? There's a whole like thing about it in the author community where people are like, my list is entirely organic because I don't want any freebie seekers. But here's the thing. I love to read books. I pay for God, I mean, the amount of money I pay for an Aura Roberts book, it's a Kindle book for God's sakes. Are you kidding me? But I pay it and I buy books, but I also love a free book. So there is no way to decide that if somebody came in through Book Funnel, they're probably just a freebie seeker, provided that you have some kind of welcome sequence that straight out just tells them if you just wanted a free book, I don't care. That's totally fine. But here's a button you can unsubscribe. I always say that's the first thing a book funnel subscriber should see is a big unsubscribe button. If you then make sure that you onboarded them properly and people made it through your welcome sequence before they got onto your list, I can tell you definitively, I do this for myself and I've got, uh, I'd have to count, but over a dozen clients that I do ongoing, do their promotions and their like swaps and stuff because they just want to write books and who could blame them. Um, I have definitely seen that if I look at a subscriber list six months after a book funnel promo, a bunch of people fell off from the book funnel or story origins promo. They just do. That's how that works. They, they just, they unsubscribed or they fell out of engagement and got moved and that's totally fine. But the people who remain six months down the line, they don't behave any differently than someone who signed up from the back of a book. They open, they click. And if you think about it, it makes total sense because how did they get on your list? They opened a newsletter, which is kind of the victory condition from some other author, and they clicked on it to download one of your books. So this is an author that writes like you. This is a reader who signs up for newsletters and opens newsletters and clicks on the things they see inside. That is already a perfect subscriber. The only problem will be if they are, in fact, the mythical freebie seeker, because there is a non-zero number of readers, I think, who at this point are just never going to pay for a book. There's too much free out there and they've gotten a little a little crooked in that way. They've gotten a little broken. That's fine. They can have the free book and they can go. Or if they pick up the book and they read it and you just didn't jive with them for some reason, for whatever reason, your style or the way you write or the particular approach you take to whatever the subject matter of the genre is, it's not for them. So they did like the author that's like you, but turns out they don't like you. It's fine. They'll unsubscribe. Everybody who stays just behaves like the, you know, mythical pedestal, Uh, organic subscriber. I don't see any difference. And that's really powerful once you realize it. Definitely. A couple of years ago, I was doing loads of book funnels and I did actually get an email from one of these mythical freebie seekers. (laughs) Most of them have always been really lovely readers who say that they've left me a review. They really enjoyed um, what happens in or afterlife calls. But this one particular person said they had something like 14,000 unread books on their e-reader and no intention of reading any of them. I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to unsubscribe you now. Yeah, thanks for letting me know, I guess. Yeah. That, that was the thing. It's like, why are you emailing to tell me you're not going to read my book? People are very strange. And there's there's just some people out there who don't understand that not every thought that flits through your head necessarily has to be expressed. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why they didn't pick that up over the course of a lifetime, but some people just haven't. What are some common mistakes you see authors make with their reader magnets? Oh goodness. Okay. So the first, the first I kind of already touched on is the people who think that if you have one, you're just going to build a list full of crappy people who don't buy books. Totally not true. I'm happy to debunk it at any time. Come at me in my Facebook mentions. That's not how Facebook works. Twitter is mentions. Come at me on Facebook. Send me an email. I'm happy to chat with you about it. I absolutely have the statistics to back it up. And I think that's really important when I'm out there like talking on behalf of, you know, Newsletter Ninja, the franchise, if you will. I'm not talking about my, like, I'm not one author telling you what happened with my stats. I am telling you this is an amalgam of, you know, a dozen or more situations, lists that vary in genre, vary in size. Some people are on one provider. Some people are on another. Some people, you know, it's all very different. But I'm here to tell you, 
non-organic subscribers can turn out to be just as good as the organic ones. So that's the first mistake is a lot of people are just like, nope, I'm not bribing people to join the list. Well, bribe them. A good bribe does wonders. The second biggest mistake I see, honestly, is um, advice that's a little bit outdated. And this was, oh, I don't know, 2014. Back in the day, what we were told to do was to make book one free on Amazon and give book two away as a reader magnet. And that would just suck in a ton of people. And that's true because in 2014, there weren't as many perma-free books. There weren't as many books, period. Um, readers were not as like overwhelmed with free stuff as they used to be. And I don't think that the Amazon sort of algorithms, the recommendation engine was understood as well as we have since come to understand it. If you make book number one perma-free on Amazon and then you give away book two as a reader magnet, I can guarantee you're not going to sell book three. You may be a unicorn, and that turns out not to be true simply by virtue of vast, vast numbers. But when we're talking about percentages, most people will pick up that book too for free because you offered it. So then what happens is Amazon sees that 20,000 people downloaded your book one and 2,000 people bought your book two. And those are not good sell through numbers. And Amazon will say, eh, probably no one cares about book three. This is all, of course, machine learning. You've got to remember it's all AI over there at Amazon. And they're sending a million or more emails every single day, right? But they're not going to include your book three in those emails to the people who picked up book two or who picked up book one because they understand that there isn't really any sell through and that they learn that nobody really likes your series and your series dies in the water. So don't do that. Definitely do not do that. Write yourself a tiny little book. Think of it as 1.5 if you must. Just a tiny little story that, again, anybody who picks up book one is absolutely going to be like, of course I need to read that story. And then if book one is free or not is entirely up to you, kind of dependent on whether you're in KU because perma-free and KU don't mix terribly well. And that's a topic for another podcast, obviously. Um, but what you do with book one is up to you, but don't sabotage your book two by making sure nobody's going to actually purchase it on any of the retailers because they will notice and that's a disaster. So that's the biggest mistake for sure, giving away book two. Yeah, like my um, first series when it took off, I had four books in it. And the thought of giving away book two and then only being able to monetize two more books just made me deeply uncomfortable. I do not like it. I don't mean to be mercenary, but I guess I am. If the time, like if I can sell a book rather than give it away, why wouldn't I do that? I want Same. to make money off of this so that I don't have to, I don't know, go bag groceries or God knows whatever happens when you don't make any money. So for me, so much, it makes so much more sense to just spend however many hours it takes to write, you know, 12 or 15,000 words. Reader magnets do not have to be long. I will warn you, they have a habit of growing, which is very frustrating. <laughs> when I say to people, just dash off 15,000 words, and they come back to me a couple of weeks later and go, yeah, that ended up being 30,000 words. And that's, yeah, but it's still better than giving away, you know, your 80 or 100,000 word book. So write yourself something short and give that away. And you'll never feel bad about that. You'll never feel like, oh, what could I have made on that? Because the answer is 30 cents. Like, what are you going to sell a short story for? You wouldn't have made anything far better. And if I could pay 30 cents each for email leads, I, I pay that in a heartbeat any day. Yeah, my latest lead magnet, I treated it as a bit of a writing experiment because I just finished book two in the series and I was trying to overhaul my process to be a bit more organized. And after interviewing a gazillion people on this show, I decided to try outlining. So it was the first project that I actually outlined. And because of that, I think I turned it around in less than a week. It's only 7,000 really words. It's not, it's not long, it's 7,000 words. But I wrote it um and then left a couple of days and then went back and edited it and because I'd got that outline and the outline was so polished there was less to pick up on when I actually went back and um went through it and I said to one of my um friends who art creates for me like this is really strange <laughs> and at this point I've got like three books that were kind of um stewing ready for the editing stage and I knew that the editing stage was going to be so much more complicated because I hadn't done this much stuff up front and I'm like why have I been making my life harder for like the past 18 books why well, because outlining is hard it really really <laughs> works but for me sometimes sometimes it just actually makes the process harder because I 
I don't know why there's a variety of reasons. And number one is probably because I'm a hot mess. Um, but if I can successfully outline something and it is always easier with a reader magnet than with a book, cause the book goes off the rails, you know, two chapters in for me always, but if I can outline a reader magnet, absolutely. I whip that thing off so much faster than if I just go, well, let's write about so-and-so sidekick and just start pantsing it, which is weird. It's weird to think that you can kind of pants or semi pants a novel more easily than the short story but I do find it to be the case oh I couldn't do that I couldn't pants an entire novel anymore the way I do it gets more organized not more rigid but more organized and I segment things off more the further in I get because I used to just do like a bullet pointed plot and I've been doing that since like book two but because I moved into fantasy and that got very complicated I needed to lay things out so that I didn't shoot myself in the foot of both feet because it could have gotten that complicated because I'm about to release book four but I'm thinking ahead to like book 10 and further along so it helps to have a lot of these things written down and be kind of outlining you know one two three books ahead because I know what I'm foreshadowing and some some things still evolve I don't treat it as very rigid why can I not speak I don't treat it as very rigid I treat it as very flexible but just having that outline means that you know, I can roll out of bed and just throw out a thousand words and I'm not kind of trying to problem solve first thing in the morning when I'm half brain dead. I'm essentially just having a conversation with fictional people, which is a lot easier first thing in the morning than trying to figure yes, out where the is. story's going next. <laughs> I think I think that you make a good point about some of it being the level of complication in, say, the story or the world building, because I can basically kind of pants a romance story. I understand the beats of romance, like so bone deep that I don't think I would ever have to actually write them down. Like I know what things happen. I'm just making up people as I go and like, oh, what this would be funny if I threw them into this situation. But for example, my lit RPG, I had to really stop and think because there was so much world building. I'm still very much a bullet points kind of outline person, but I definitely had to make sure that I had all of those bullet points in order and that everything would make sense and happen in, you know, a way that cohesively allowed the world to build properly. Um, Not a problem I have in romance, which is just my world. You're always world building in romance, obviously, but mostly it involves, for me at least, because a lot of what I do involves billionaires, it mostly just involves figuring out what the most expensive hotel in New York is. Um, I do a lot of Googling for (laughs) what is the most expensive X? And that's fun. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's a lot easier than world building when you're yes. creating something out of nothing or yes. trying to put a spin on an old myth, for example. Yes, exactly. Easier. My urban fantasy that I'm working on right now is based in Celtic mythology. And A, those people were freaking crazy. <laughs> they were crazy. Their mythology is insane. It's people who are actually salmon or birds or whatever. <laughs> um, and anytime I want to grab something that's kind of the common like urban fantasy mythos, like a werewolf or a vampire or whatever, I'm digging back into Celtic mythology and going, they don't really have werewolves. They have one werewolf. There was one guy who was a werewolf. (laughs) So how do I take this folklore and then build kind of an actual mythology out of it? It's very funny, but I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it quite a bit. And I think that um, I've always been a proponent of the idea that fences make good fiction. So I kind of like the fact that if I go and I look at something in Celtic mythology and I'm like, oh, there was only one werewolf ever. So how do I get werewolves out of this I could just be like whatever who cares what the mythology says here what here's what I say but I make myself make it make sense it forces you to be kind of a little bit more inventive are there any people who are going to read this and go I am an expert in Celtic mythology and I'm very impressed by how she handled this maybe one (laughs) so I guess I'm writing for that one person but I feel like it makes me be more creative in the long run and that is exciting and then bring it back to newsletters because I'm Tammy. Those also are great stories to then tell your people, right? So you're doing this research in folklore or mythology for some kind of fantasy or whatever, or you're doing research on, I don't know, because I'm not good at science, but black holes or space travel or whatever. Those are also really cool things to share with your, um, with your newsletter and tell them, here's the thing I was reading that helped me to come up with the idea for such and such. Some people will not care, but I always write my newsletter kind of for like super fan type people. So I include those details and it seems to get a pretty good result. I even do it with the billionaire stuff. You know, I'll be like, Hey, remember that scene where such and such happened? The Baccarat is an actual hotel. And yes, it is 
nothing but hanging crystals everywhere you look. And here's a link to the website and here's, you know, whatever the menu. Also, there's a lot of food porn in my billionaire romance because I just love to talk about fancy food. Uh, So here's a menu for the restaurant or whatever. People love that stuff. They really do. I had a student come through my advanced course. I think the most recent time I ran it, which would have been December. And she writes mail, mail romance and her reader magnets for the people who subscribe to her list are what she calls that visual guides. I think she calls them. And so at the end of every book, it says, do you want to see the visual guide for this book? And it's the clothes that people were wearing that she talked about and the recipes that they made and the places they stayed and the lake they visited. And it's just all just, here's this long list of like pictures and descriptions of the places that I use to create the settings of this novel. People love them. They love them. They just like to peek behind the scenes. If you're a super fan of like, anything. I'm a super fan of like everything. I don't have any lukewarm feelings about anything ever. Um, If you're a super fan of something, then you know, you know, you want to know the behind the scenes stuff. I am a super fan of Doctor Who. I spent a lot of time looking at set pictures from the upcoming 60th anniversary because there are some characters being brought back that I love. And that's the sort of thing that I'm always trying to give to my fans. If only I had a fan base the size of the Doctor Who fan base, right? If only we all did. I've been currently binge binge watching and reading Stranger Things stuff because I watched the entire fourth season in like a day. (laughs) So now I'm like, I've uh, got to wait until July. I'm like, how do I fill that void until then? (sighs) Trying to find like other horror to watch that fills the gap and nothing is just working. Nothing fills that particular gap is my understanding. I actually haven't watched it yet. It's a thing that obviously I will love. Everyone who knows me is like, you will love it. So what are you doing? Um, But it seems pretty clear that it occupies a very specific niche where some things intersect that there isn't necessarily anything out there that's going to scratch that itch, which is a really quality problem to have as a creator. Like, must be nice to be the people creating Stranger Things and to know that your people are still going to be waiting there because they can't get the thing you're giving them anywhere else, which as indie authors is definitely a thing that we want to be striving for, but it's hard. Yeah, I realized the other day that Stranger Things has been influencing my fantasy. (laughs) I love it. That's fantastic, though. If something's out there and it's like in the zeitgeist, as they say, you you obviously want to pick, you know, little bits of that and integrate them as best you can. You obviously can't just like steal whole cloth, but you can definitely be like, that's a mood and I can create this mood over here. Or that's an intriguing way to do it. Can I do something like that with the characters I made? And you can like do some fun stuff. I, it's usually the feelings for me. So if I'm watching something and it gives me a ton of feelings, I'm like, okay, how do I write something that will make people feel like that? That's what I want is to, is to write something that I know people will go, oh my God, you got me right in the feels. That's the biggie for me. Yeah. Same. And like, Afterlife Cause is written from dual mother and daughter point of view. I describe it as an English Gilmore Girls with ghosts and the people (laughs) who enjoy it. Thank you. The people who enjoy it absolutely love it. But I have had some reviews where people think I'm confused about what audience I'm writing for. Because if you think about it, Gilmore Girls, Stranger Things, stuff like that, like they're all TV shows. You don't get the different ages represented very much in books. And I think it does throw people off if they're not expecting it. I think so. But the other thing, of course, is that if you have that kind of like laser focused understanding of the audience that you're writing for. So you're like, I'm not writing for everyone who likes a cozy mystery. I'm writing for people who like a cozy mystery. And they also like this show and that show and this kind of character and this kind of world building that gives you something to talk to people about as they join your newsletter, because you can really outline that for them during that welcome sequence. Hey, I'm so-and-so and here a list of things I love. If you love those five things, stay tuned. If you only like one of those things might not be for you. It lets you kind of tell people who you are and what you're doing and give them kind of signal for them what it is that they can expect for you. And that means sometimes people will go, I hate most of those things. That sounds awful. Okay, fine. But the person who goes, holy crap, that's me. Like you just described me. They're not going anywhere. They're going to whitelist you if you ask them to. They're going to download every reader magnet. They're going to, their friends who are like them, they're going to take your books and they're going to push them at their friends. You're not going to believe this. Like this is such a good book. You will love everything about it. It has the X of this show. It has the Y of that show. And also it's super funny. 
those are, that's the mythical super fan that we keep talking about. And you can't unfortunately build those people without having some kind of way to communicate with them because the chances that someone's going to read one of your books and take it and say to their friends, I could tell from reading this, that she loves stranger things and Gilmore girls. It's pretty slim. But if you said that right to them in the welcome to the newsletter and they went click that checks out, then they've got this language to help explain what you're all about to the other people that they recommend the books to. And the number one reason that anybody buys a book ever is because someone they trusted recommended it to them. That has not changed in the, I don't know, indie publishing's over 10 years old at this point. That was always the case back in the day before indie publishing, and it has not changed. All the Amazon ads in the world, all the book funnel bundles, all the everything, none of that has changed the fact that that is the number one reason. No, that's a lie. It's the number two reason. Number one reason someone buys a book is because they read a book by that author before and liked it. Number two is because someone they trusted recommended it to them. Super powerful. So- do that. Leverage fan bases. Yeah, it makes a massive difference because some of my favorite authors I discovered because one of my friends recommended them to me. And I find a lot of the time when people recommend books, they think about their experience reading it where as opposed to if it's my kind of book. Mm-hmm. But when you've got friends who are on your wavelength and do read the same kind of thing, that's just so powerful because the friend who recommends books to me she is the kind of person who will watch Gilmore Girls and not quite watch Stranger Things because it's a bit too horror but she yeah (laughs) she will watch like the different fantasy shows I think like some of like the Demogorgon and stuff a bit too much like they freaked me out and she's um (laughs) she gets a bit jumpy but like she recommended um, Vampire Academy to me and Rochelle Mead's now one of my favorite authors, you know. And I think back to when I was a child and I didn't read a lot, no one around me read either. So I didn't have anyone to give me those book recommendations and it does matter. It makes a humongous difference. And when somebody recommends a book to me, like it basically happens one of two ways, right? They'll say, I read X and I loved it. And that's great. I'll definitely put that on my you know, TBR and I want to check that out because I am friends with people who are mostly like me in key ways. So that's cool. But the other way is that someone will say to me, I read this book and I thought about you because of how much you love The Good Place or how much you love Nora Roberts or whatever thing. It, I love a lot of things. I truly am a huge super fan of stuff. So if someone says to me, like, I read this. And I thought about like, you know, how you would talk about this concept because you love the good place so much. I'm going to pick that book up. If they say I bought this and it made me think of, you know, you because of Dr. Who someone just recommended that I watch the time traveler's wife because it's being produced apparently by Stephen Moffat. And I don't cry enough, I guess. So (laughs) I'm going to have to check that out because Stephen Moffat time traveling wife. Oh, where have I seen that before? That's right. An entire three seasons of Dr. Who that are some of my favorite television in the world. So yes, I will check that out. That person like understood that they're, you know, chocolate got in my peanut butter and they (laughs) know what I will like. So that's, it's just super, super powerful. If someone has some language, which you fortunately supplied them with to explain to somebody why this is the perfect book for them makes a big difference. It really does. But I guess for authors, it can feel a little bit overwhelming, particularly early on when you've got to learn how to publish a book, how to write a book, how to edit a book, how to market a book, how to set up an email list, whatever other things that you've got to learn, depending on what you're writing. So what would your advice be to an author who is feeling overwhelmed by having to create that reader magnet on top of the gazillion other things that they've got going on, both in terms of the book itself and in terms of whatever's going on in their life outside of that? I would tell them just to do the first thing, just that's it. And whenever you're overwhelmed with anything, that's just do the next thing on the list. So the things that you need to create a decent reader magnet are you have to have an idea, ideally that relates to your series. So stop, sit down, the series that you decided, we talked about that a little bit ago, the most popular one, the least popular one, the next one, whatever, whatever series you decided you're going to do your cookie for, sit down, read the first book of that series. Usually the first book is the place you want to get the idea because you want to be able to offer the cookie right after the first book. So something that happened in the first book, somebody that was inter introduced, something that was referenced, the thing you said about how you often mention the mom getting outed, but that story isn't in the book. That's perfect. Something that happens off screen. I often use an urban fantasy example by an author. Her name is Ginevra Black. 
And um, what happens with Ginevra is that uh, her main character is a necromancer and she accidentally reanimates. She does not know she's a necromancer because that's Urban Fantasy 101. Um, She's just going to learn over the course of book one. She accidentally reanimates her hamster that has died. So we've got this hamster that is now a revenant, but she doesn't understand. And she's just like, he's sick. There's something not right with this hamster because there is something not right with this hamster. Her roommate takes the hamster to the vet And partway through the book, when she has realized what's going on, there's a moment where someone mentions him and she and her, she has now acquired a zombie sidekick. They sort of look at each other like, oh shit. And they take off like, oh shit. (laughs) The zombie hamster is at the emergency vet. And the next time we see them, because there's a, a, a scene in between from someone else's point of view, the next time we see them, they're sitting in his car. The zombie has a car. It's a long story. It's a very funny book. Um, and she has, the main character has this hamster cage in her lap and they basically just say, let's never talk about that again. And the at the end, and I would argue, honestly, that story does not belong in the book. It's quite long. It ended up being, I think, like 40 pages when I, I did the edit for that. So I think it was like 40 pages in Word. Um, and it's very much a side quest. It doesn't come to bear on anything else that happens. So I was perfectly comfortable saying, that's your reader magnet. You need to tell that story, but you can't tell it in here. And so she wrote the story about what happens during that essentially side quest. So if you can pull something like that out of the book and go, people are going to want to know this, then that's absolutely perfect. There's a science fiction and fantasy writer who also teaches um, some courses on writing. Her name is Holly Lyle, L-I-S-L-E. And Holly calls these muse bombs. So like your muse left you a little something that you didn't even realize you were putting in there when you wrote the story. But when you go back through and you look, you can blow it up oh, look at that. And you can explode that and make like a cool story. Or you can write something into a later book, even this is not reader magnet related, but you're, you know, you're in book four and like kind of scratching your head for something cool to do. If you can go back and find a muse bomb in book one and you blow it up in book four, you look super smart because it looks like you planned that all the way back in book one when you wrote that, when actually you're just kind of leveraging a little loose end that you left for yourself. So those kinds of things are usually the best way to do it. Read through your book one. What's the question in there? What's something you mentioned or something cool or a character you didn't explore enough? And how can you then write a reader magnet about that? And my fallback is usually the prequel does not work for romance because nobody wants to hear a lot about the life before the romance. But for almost every other genre, a prequel works great. A character's backstory, a villain backstory, people love a villain backstory like you wouldn't believe. Um, The story of your world, if you're writing fantasy or science fiction, you may have like folklore or tales that people tell write one of those. Um, The mom, the story about the mom. Um, For the cozy author that I was talking about earlier who wrote their cookie and actually had a little bit of a list to launch to before when book one came out, what they ended up doing was going back and writing about her high school prom, the main character's high school prom, which is the first time she ever sees a ghost. And so since she can see ghosts in the series proper, that worked out really well. And now in book one, of course, they went in and seeded a couple of references to the disastrous events at prom, which they do not detail in the book because you pick that up in the reader magnet. So that's all. Just pick one, pick whichever one, go through, read your book one, figure out what you can blow up or take out or elaborate on off to the side and then write honest to goodness, it does not have to be a lot. You said that your reader magnet or one of them was like 7,000 words. Um, Yeah, I think I've got one that's about 1,500. Yeah, my steamy pen name, hers are all complete stories in one way or another. And I think the shortest is like 5,000 words. I made that a second chance romance because then you get to throw out like most of the, like all the beats are over because we already met, we already fell in love. It's all assumed. Um, So the shortest is 5,000. I think the longest is 12,000. Um, romance writers who are doing extended epilogues. I mean, it can be like, literally, I'm not kidding, 800 words, you know, it's just a little bit more from the story. And if you want to do a whole complete kind of side story, like I said, Ginevra's ended up really long, um, but it works really well. It also, this is actually just another element. I talk about this a lot in the cookie book. Um, the book I read about cookies, not one of my reader magnets. <laughs> one of the things that she did that I think is especially brilliant is she wrote without really meaning to what I call a convertible cookie, meaning that it works for people who know you and it works for people who don't. Because an extended epilogue, for example, is only going to be a back of book call to action. That's not the sort of thing you can really put 
from Book Funnel because who wants to read your extended epilogue if they didn't read your book? But if you can write a story that is a prequel or a side story or you know a folk tale or something that someone can read even though they've never read anything that you've written, that pulls in complete strangers and they can then sell through to your catalog. And so that particular reader magnet that Ginevra wrote, the point of view character is actually not in the book series proper. So it's okay that there's like, they don't have to assume any knowledge of like the world building or the mechanics or how the zombie situation works, or that's Norse mythology that she's writing about, but you don't have to know any of that because they learn along with that main character as events happen but it did make it long that can you know that's the the downside of that is that you have to do a little bit more exposition because the people who don't know you yet do need to get a foothold into what it is that you're writing about so you gotta do a little world building which is fine i like world building so it's always fine with me in short which i'm not good at just pick the next thing pick the one cookie that you can write don't look at your whole catalog don't think it has to be fifty thousand words don't worry about how you're going to market it even if you do nothing but put it in the back of your books you're going to increase signups. So just pick the one thing, do the one thing, and then you can use the data from that to decide what to do next. If it takes off and it's like gangbusters, you can be like, okay, prequels for all trilogies from now on. If it doesn't maybe work as well as you had hoped, try a different kind of reader magnet next time and see how that works. There's, the thing is, these are assets that are going to last forever. Think about them the same way you think about the books that you're publishing on the retailers, right? You're going to do the work now and hey, working sucks. I want to get paid to stay home and do nothing and it isn't happening yet. And I'm very annoyed, but you do this work and it works for you forever. You've got this asset now that you can put in different venues, leverage in different ways, get people onto the list. If you're looking at it in three years and it's tired and it doesn't really drive signups anymore, throw it on Amazon for free, whole new audience, right? That works as a reader magnet in a different way, because of course you can't compel a sign up, but with a really killer CTA at the end may well work anyway. So you can do all kinds of things and play with them all kinds of ways. And they're an asset that you will have forever. So it is worth trying one and then seeing what happens. What are your thoughts on using something like deleted scenes? as a reader magnet and said say if you cut a chapter from the book because you realize it doesn't move the story along but it maybe fleshes out a character's relationships and it's kind of cute or kind of funny um but it just doesn't fit the book i like that a lot um in the cookie book i have just kind of a list here's a list of like 30 things that might be cool for a reader magnet and one of those things is like deleted scenes um i think of it like uh like uh, what am I trying to say? Like DVD extras, right? So if you think about what's on a DVD extra commentary about something behind the scenes, deleted scenes, um, uh, epilogues, extended this, whatever, anything that like could have come into the book, could have wound up in the book, but ended up not being appeals again to those super fans that we were talking about. So most people, certainly anyone who doesn't know your books, but most people might be like, I don't care about a deleted scene. And I would actually not care about most deleted scenes, but you know what, for some things that I really love, I would want to see them. Um, Other things that work really well are like a scene that is already in the book, but written from a different point of view romance or anything that's really romance adjacent, like um, some UF has like heavy romance sub- subplots, that kind of thing. Um, they love to see, you know, the meet cute from the hero's point of view instead of the heroines or the first time that they, you know, hook up or whatever. People love a flipped point of view scene. Those are also really easy to write because you've already got all the dialogue and all of the action beats. So you just flip it and then you got to read it real carefully to make sure, you know, you you've got your dialogue tags right and everybody, nobody knows anything they shouldn't know. But those are pretty easy because you're kind of repurposing stuff you already wrote. I love those. I absolutely love them. Um, So yeah, I think you should. Alternate scenes. So I wrote this scene and then that didn't work out. So I ended up writing it a little bit differently and here's where it kind of diverted, but this is how it looked the first time through. The only problem with that is that you want to make sure that you don't put yourself in a position where you're getting responses from readers who are like, um, well, you shouldn't have deleted that one because it's better than the one you published. So because as we've discussed, some people don't know how to not say everything that they think. And you don't want to get a bunch of backseat writers, you know, who are who are sending you emails about things. But if you have the right sort of fan base and they're not going to like decide they know how to write your books better than you, um, that's a great thing to share with them because it makes them feel, you know, like like you're sharing, which is nice. 
Yeah, I have some deleted scenes I wrote from uh, the hero's point of view. And his point of view was originally going to be in book two. And when I was editing book two, I thought, you know what, this is cute and funny, but it adds absolutely nothing to the story. There is no point in me including that. And I've had a few people tell me I need to repurpose it as a reader magnet. And I mostly just keep forgetting. (laughs) You should definitely give it a try. People would probably love it. And I like hats off to you for recognizing that because that is truly the definition of killing your darlings when something is just so great and you're like oh man but it does not belong here this is just self-indulgent I'm gonna pull it the good news is you can pull it and you can still get some benefit out of it and that's the victory condition as far as I'm concerned that's a win-win Yeah, I had to write it because I needed to know if the book worked with it or not and it was useful for me to kind of flesh out the relationship between these two characters and the bromance as it develops because they basically become housemates out of nowhere, just out of the blue. And so it's quite sweet, really. But yeah, I had to write it. And there's a lot of it because one of them is a mummy who's 4,000 years old. Everything's really weird to him. And there's like some really cute scenes. Yeah, there's really cute (laughs) scenes where like he's been introduced to a nice cup of tea and a slice of toast and, you know, very English food, basically. And it's just weird to him. And that was so fun to write about how everything was strange and even like the fabric felt different on his skin. And I really enjoyed that and the comedy of that. And it even gave me like university flashbacks because we once had to write a scene about something that um, we experienced a lot, but that from the point of view of someone it was completely alien to. So it was really enjoyable. But like the more I went through the book, the more I was like, it's not adding anything It's just comedy. Like, yeah, comedy's great, right? But if the scene is purely there for either the comedy or to flesh out a secondary relationship, there are better ways to show it. I'm just nodding. I'm nodding, which is not not great in a podcast format. It's also on speaker view, so no one on YouTube could see you nodding. I was just sitting there quietly. (laughs) I am. I'm nodding yes because I 100% agree, and also that sounds super fun. I I love any kind of fish out of water story like that. Of you know, four thousand year old mummy having to like deal with whatever. Um, in um in the book I was talking about earlier, the Ginevra Black book, there's a there's a six foot fish man that they sort of bring into their uh, tribe. If you and you're not supposed to say tribe into their squad. Um. And he's hilarious because, of course, it's not easy to make it through the world as a six foot fish man who refuses to wear pants. So, like, there's just this he he, he has to be in the bathtub. Like, do we need to buy salt? Uh, We can't let the roommate see him. She's like, not. No, you can't go in the bathroom because there's a six foot fish man in the tub. So it's like all of this hilarity with trying to get this anachronistic character through this reality that your mummy makes me think of and he would that would be very funny the poor mummy for our listeners and me who want to check out Ginevra's book how do you spell her surname just to double check (laughs) the surname is black so it's Uh, not surname first name I can tell the difference it's g-e-n-e-v-r-a the book itself is called the wait no (laughs) I was gonna say it's called the necromancer's daughter that's the series and that's probably real easy because I bet everybody knows how to spell necromancer I hope Um, so the series is called the necromancer's daughter and that first book is called rune awakening like a play on rude awakening all the all the titles have like little pun things I admire her so much I'm just like oh my god you're so clever and she's like I wasn't trying to be which is very annoying like I want people to at least acknowledge like yes I worked hard to be as clever as I am but no it just accidentally fell into being clever great good for you yeah Um, I I love that, that series. That series is so fun. If you like urban fantasy, you could not do any better. I mean, until mine is published, in which case it will be the best urban fantasy, of course. Of course. But in the meantime, we can read in Ginevra. The meantime, yeah. And I'm very, I'm fine. Obviously, excited. mine is about necromancer as well. So, see, who doesn't love a necromancer? You gotta exactly. love a necromancer. And there's, um, oh, what's her name? I just forgot. Haley Edwards. Haley Edwards writes urban fantasy about necromancers, which I also love. So, apparently, this is a this is one of my tropes. I love a necromancer. <laughs> To be fair, that's what I started binge reading right before I came up with the idea for the ghost call. And initially they were ghost hunters, not necromancers. And it ended up expanding because I thought if I just focus on ghost hunting, it's going to get boring really fast. But if I consider the afterlife and all the ways that can manifest or the afterlife, I'm using air quotes for listeners, which is how the mummy came into it. Then I've also got other things like vampires and zombies and ghosts coming back from the other side and all these things that I can play with, most of which I've just listed aren't even in the books yet. So they may or may not appear. 
You'll have to wait and see, depending on which direction my brain decides to go in. Well, and the thing is, if you're doing that, not only are you keeping yourself interested, but it's almost guaranteed that if you yourself are continuing to be interested and intrigued by the stuff that you're writing about, your readers will be. Whereas if you're just telling the same tired ghost hunter story, every single book, you're going to get bored and they're definitely going to get bored. So yeah, keep it fun. Well, exactly. There's got to be a level of it being formulaic so that it's almost comforting and people know what to expect, but also you've got to shake things up a little bit. And I think that's what Stranger Things does quite well because a lot of the reviews I read for it before it came out said that it, oh, there was a really great quote and I've got it, but they said it was something like formulaic, but fabulous. I don't think it was fabulous, fantastic. Like it played to the formula well and it kind of upped the ante and it spun things on its head at the same time. And well, because that's what readers want, right? The same, but different. That's what they yeah. want. Every single book, the same, but different. Um, and that can be hard. That's a, that can be a tough, a tough uh, needle to thread, if you will. But if you can do it, it works out amazingly. And then again, if, if these people are the sort of people who, you know, become super fans of things, there's a point down the road where you can, you know, send a newsletter and tell them, here's where I made the decision to jump off the rails on what you might normally expect in a story. So that's why my urban fantasy is like X instead of just continuing to do a thing that you expected. And the readers who really love that moment will go, oh, that's so cool. I'm really glad that I knew that. And the readers who didn't love it probably aren't still around on the list. So you've really, you've really won them over. I remember um, part of uh, my onboarding and someone told me like, you can't say that. You can't tell that to your readers. Like that's why would you say that to them? But part of the onboarding for my steamy romance pen name, I mentioned that I was writing a serial. It was billionaire romance, very, you know, kind of bog standard what billionaire romance was back in, I don't even remember 2015, but it was boring. I was so bored. <laughs> I was like, this is stupid. So I threw a murder in. There's actually a review for that book that says, imagine my surprise when it turned into romantic suspense. And I was like, imagine mine, because I too was surprised. Um, but I mentioned that in the newsletter, like I did this, this, and this, and it was all very great, but it was the same thing everybody else was writing. And I thought I got to shake this up. And so there's a murder. Sorry. Um, I get a bunch of replies to that where people are like, that was the part that made me love it. I was so shocked. I didn't expect it. Um, they want something a little different. They want the comfort, but then they love it if you just give them a little shake up. And it takes some some savvy about a genre to understand what you can shake up and what you can't, obviously. Um, but if you can, if you know, and you know that I can do this thing and it's going to be the same, but a little bit different, people really get excited about that. And so you should. I really do. Like, about half of my readers joined me when I moved over to fantasy. And they connect with the exact same things that they connected with in my What Happens in Hollywood books, because they're all basically about found family and love and supporting each other. It's just that the other series happens to involve ghosts. That's the main difference. I do love found family. I've come to realize I do, and I didn't know that I did until a few weeks ago when I spoke to Gail Carragher about the heroine's journey. And since then, I've realized how many tropes related to it I've been binging my entire life. Well, that's the thing. So it seems as though you've just internalized a bunch of stuff and that, yeah. you know what I mean? Like some people have to really be analytical about it and sit down and go, what tropes are in this series that I like? And there's nothing wrong with that. Everybody's brain is different, but some people have just sort of internalized it and just spit out stuff that works within certain tropes and themes because they understand how it is that they work. And that's great. It does make things easier. It also makes them harder in a way because when you can't quite articulate what you're doing or why, and you suddenly discover it eight books later, you're like, oh, oh, okay. Well, I wish I'd known this. I would have leaned into it a little harder or made it a little more obvious or whatever. But you take your gifts where you find them. Yeah, I think it's only since I've started doing this podcast, I've started to analyze why I like things more. And it's sometimes because guests will go, oh, why do you think you like that? I'm like, I have no idea. And then the question just goes round and round in my head until I do figure it out for the next time I'm asked. Yep. <laughs> that checks out. Speaking of things that you love, What's one book that has changed your life? I'm going to go a little afield with this 
I'm thinking about it um, because this is not a genre I write in or ever would write in. And um, this is not by any means my favorite author, but I do think that probably my favorite book in the entire world is Weave World by Clive Barker. It is a book that I, I had never heard of him. Um, this was, I would have been, I don't know, a teenager. It wouldn't have been out very long anyway. Um, I discovered it remaindered, like in the remainder bin for like a dollar or whatever, in a bookshop in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, North Conway, to be exact. Shout out to the White Mountains. And just picked it up because it had kind of an interesting cover. Um, And I think there was probably a blurb, a Stephen King blurb. I think Steve King blurbed that book. I've seen The Future of Horror and its name is Clive Barker. That was everywhere for a while. They actually are nothing alike. (laughs) They write nothing, nothing alike. So that's wild. Um, It is the first book I ever read, I think, that was so utterly fantastical and yet completely immersive. There was a point at which I was reading it and just genuinely so immersed in the fantasy world that he created that I I believed in it. I believed in it 100 percent as fully as I believed in the actual real world that I live in. And while it is not urban fantasy, it is very much horror. The whole point of that novel is that this other world exists just butted right up against ours and you could fall into it at any time, which is part of why urban fantasy is so my jam. I love that idea of this whole kind of urban fantasy world living beside us that most of the normals don't know anything about. You know, recent like TV series, like Grimm was a TV series where that happened a lot. I don't know if you ever saw that, but I really liked that story well for a while. Um, and, And most urban fantasy is that there it's not, um, the secret world is kind of not known and the whole process of the hero hero or heroine becoming introduced to that. I love that. I love the world that's right up against our world and you could fall in at any minute and it's totally alien and you have to rethink everything you thought you knew. Um, He's also a master of just like language and imagery and it's just a very good book, technically speaking, but it was the first book that ever made me feel like that. And I think it's been really important to my formation as an author to understand that you have to write things that are immersive, even if it's just my billionaire nonsense, figuring out what's the most expensive restaurant in New York. I look at the menu. I look at the pictures of the hotel rooms. I look at all of that stuff and I try to write really immersively. And I think that makes a humongous difference. So that is the book I would pick. I feel like that book might fill my Stranger Things void based on what you just (gasps) said. Oh my gosh, it might. Because it's two little... worlds like this, that that is Stranger Things. Now, see, I really have to watch Stranger Things. but I Have think, you not seen I any think, of it? I haven't seen any of it. Everybody oh tells me God. I will love it. The people one thing know I will me say, very well. I, yeah. I always warn people, it's really slow at the start of the season. And I say this as a person with a very short attention span. <laughs> But because it spends the early episodes fleshing out the ensemble cast and slowly building the horror, it's not as irritating as some horror where you don't give a shit about the characters and they're still building things up. Because I remember watching the remake of a classic horror with my boyfriend. And by the end of the film, I was not scared of the ghost and I was bored shitless. And I was emotionally detached because not one of those characters was I emotionally invested in because they'd spent so much time on the horror aspect. They'd forgotten that the reason horror is scary is because you care about the people it's happening to or you relate to them. When something bad happens to a bunch of people who are kind of disposable and interchangeable, it is very hard to get invested. I think that a lot of modern horror, unfortunately, pays attention to making like the monster super interesting or the horror extra gory or the twist is really crazy and does, like you said, forget. None of that matters if the people who are dying are people I don't give a shit about. Yeah. And I think that's why Stranger Things works. And that's why the Conjuring universe works as well, because at its heart, the Conjuring is about a relationship. It's about this couple. Like, regardless of that's so important. I remember there was a movie a while back. Wow, we're really going far afield now. There was a movie, oh God, probably eight, nine years ago. I don't know. The time has no meaning anymore. Um, That, you know, people, it was kind of polarizing because the ending, because they showed the monster too much is what happened. But um, there was a movie produced by Guillermo del Toro called Mama. I had the Game of Thrones guy in it, that handsome one. Um, So, It was actually a tremendously good movie as far as I was concerned. And while I do agree they showed the monster too much, I also didn't see how they couldn't. Like the ending kind of required it. But the thing that stuck with me is I saw an interview with Guillermo del Toro where he said, and it 
just resonated so hard. He said, we are not telling the story of a monster. We're telling the story of a human emotion grown monstrously out of proportion. And that's a completely different feel, right? That's, you're rubbing your arm. Did you get a little goose bumpy? Because that's an amazing amazing thing to say. And I think that's the thing is we need to be appealing to people's emotions and not just like, what's the weirdest thing I can throw out? What's the craziest idea? What's going to really keep them off balance? Like, just remember people care about other people. Yeah, um, I remember, I'm going to like butcher what I'm remembering now because I remember it really badly. But it was this interview with someone and they were talking about horror and how it started out as this fear of certain emotions and what, you know, just ex- a way to express things, basically. I am completely butchering that, by the way. But it reminds me of stuff that is st- that still works and works very well. It's things like the Babadook, which is a extended metaphor for grief that was one of the films that won me over to the horror genre because it's got a punch to it is it a perfect film no but the director fought for the ending of that film and i won't give away and say what it was but the ending is powerful and it's even more powerful if you know that it is an extended metaphor for grief yeah i would say going back to the same movie that the ending of mama is um It is not, it's clearly made by people who are not American is the thing (laughs) I tell people about watching it. Um, Because uh, again, not wanting to give away too much, but there is a moment where there's sort of a pause and you can completely see the Hollywood ending. How like, oh, this happy thing happens and then this will happen and then it's resolved. And then, you know, for a horror movie, that was a pretty happy ending. And then they literally throw that away, (laughs) gone. And it does not happen. That beautiful Hollywood ending that I saw clear as a bell. They're like, yeah, no. And they chuck it over a cliff and they do something completely different. Um, And it is not a happy ending. I don't want to say too much, but it like surprised me. It surprised and delighted me. And I think that that is really, really important. I want, I want people to have strong feelings about my stuff. That's basically the bottom line there. And if you can engender those strong feelings, and if you know what you're doing that did that, if you can explain that to people in some way, that gives them that behind the scenes thing that they love so much that turns you into this kind of super fan factory, right? That's, I think, really important. A lot of people kind of want to do this whole Wizard of Oz thing where they're behind the curtain and they don't want to talk to readers and they don't want to give away their secrets and this and that and the other. Listen, I've seen every interview that Russell Davies or Stephen Moffat has done about Doctor Who. I know their writing process. I know how they made the decisions they made. I know the decisions they didn't make because they did this other thing instead. And not one bit of that has ever like lessened my enjoyment of the franchise. I love knowing all that stuff. It makes me feel like an insider. So if you're just kind of doing that with your people. Here are the tropes I play with. Here are the reasons I made decisions. Here's what my books are like and how they're different from the other books that you like. Then you you cement them to you as super fans and not to be a broken freaking record or anything, but you can't do that on Amazon. You can't do that on Facebook where most people don't see your posts. You do that in your newsletter. You just always have to do that in the audience that you have kind of captive on the receiving end of your emails. So yeah, always bringing it back to newsletters, guys. That's how I roll. I do find that kind of content works really well, though, because when mm-hmm. I um, launched the last Hollywood book, Hollywood Heartbreak, I was talking about all sorts of different influences. I was talking about Marilyn Monroe, because um, mm-hmm. I've got a character who's kind of like inspired by the fact that she came across in one way, but it was actually very different. And how I do have this like very strange, obsessive knowledge of Marilyn Monroe and Audrey Hepburn. <gasps> That's wild. She's one of my, I have um, uh, attention deficit disorder. And one of the things that happens to me is I go down these rabbit holes, right? And I learn everything about something. And then I'm a huge super fan. She's one of my pet topics. I love her. Same, same. And the thing is now I can watch something about either of them. It's like, I know all of this. This is really boring. (laughs) I know. You're like, I'm an expert. Hello. Yeah. So yeah, if you get, you know, you tell your list, here's all this cool stuff I learned about Marilyn Monroe. And that's why this book, you know, turned out how it did. Here's the themes I was putting in. Here's the things I was thinking about that made it happen this way instead of happening that way. And then people have that glimpse behind the scenes and they love it. Yeah. And I've actually got a video on my YouTube channel where I talk about Marilyn Monroe and that does weirdly well. 
I'm totally going to And the this. other thing that does well on the Writer's Mindset YouTube channel is me talking about how my obsession with ancient Egypt and mummies started. And it's even funnier because Ellie, who is my co-host and best friend, didn't know how it started. Really? Even though she was there for the entire thing. <laughs> well, not... The funny thing is not everybody's paying as much attention to us as we as we think they probably should be. Yeah, that's true. And she probably just forgot the kind of ongoing commentary that she gets from me. Yeah. So, who? Okay. Wrapping up then. All right. We'll wrap up. We've been on for a long time. We have a lot to talk about. I love that. Fun. So much better than not having anything to talk about. Exactly. So I believe you have a little present for our listeners. I do. It's not any great shakes, which is funny because this is the reader magnet lady. I actually really struggle with lead magnets for my, for my um, nonfiction audience, but I have just a little cheat sheet. It's called like 10 tips for writing emails. People want to read or something of that nature. Uh, You think I'd know the name of my own tip sheet. (laughs) Um, And you can get that if you just go to newsletterninja.net slash TWM for the writer's mindset. The opt-in is optional. You do not have to join the main mailing list, although you certainly can. And I would be delighted to have you. People seem to really like my emails. I get a lot of responses to emails, which is nice. I include pictures of my dogs who are brindle striped and who doesn't want to see a couple of gorgeous brindle striped dogs. So there's that. Um, And I have a couple of other cool freebies coming down the pike that I'll drop on the list as well. So, but you don't have to join if you don't want to, you can just take that tip sheet and run off and enjoy it. Hopefully it would be helpful. Amazing. Thank you so much. Hopefully our lovely writers We'll check that out. And thank you for this great chat. It's been really, really fun. No problem. It was awesome to talk to you. Thank you. Wow, that was a long episode. If you're still here, and I hope you are, and you enjoyed The Writer's Mindset, we'd be super grateful if you could leave us a rating or review on the podcast platform of your choice. It really helps other writers find us so that we can help them achieve their wildest writing dreams too. And make sure you check out newsletterninja.net forward slash TWM for your free 12-step cheat sheet that Tammy put together especially for our listeners. If you'd like early access to episodes, a chance to submit questions for our guests, and to listen to that new bonus series, Healthy Habits, come and join us over on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash writers mindset. We've got a lot of big things planned, but we can only do them with your support. Every little bit helps us to help you more, whether it's a rating, a review, or becoming a patron. We'll see you next time. Keep writing.